Thank you so much. The welcome was very warm indeed. <laughs> very grateful for that. Um, I represent the team, uh, which is called the Center for Special Technologies, as Silke pointed out. Um, we like to think of ourselves as this kind of undisciplined group who hacks around with different tools. And in fact, before the Russian invasion a while ago, when we just were starting out, we dealt with a lot of different issues. Um, all of them involved these kind of clever tools of spatial analysis and visualization, but they were applied to topics that are kind of forward thinking and hopeful. So we dealt a lot with issues of um, affordable housing and housing affordability, and also um, kind of questions of sustainability and um, I, I can see that um, my slide is not here. But um, one of the projects that uh, that kind of represent that, that, that work is uh, called DOMA. Um, are we gonna see the, the screen? I, because most of my presentation is here. I'm just the, the voice who tries to uh, up help explain what's going on. I see it now, they, they hid it from you. Uh, all right, there you go. Unveiling. Uh, well, so, so DOMA is this project that imagines the transition towards affordable and equitable housing via mechanisms of kind of smart contract inspired distributed ownership where uh, a bunch of city dwellers own shares in, in uh, apartments together with Francis Tseng on a commission of a Vancouver-based art institution, which is called 221A. We developed this situ um, simulation game, which is based on real-world data, based on the fear of automated landlords that are buying a bunch of properties in the US. Um, and it lets you play as commons against this kind of automated landlords to try to take the ownership of the city back and not let them completely uh, kind of erode um, public ownership of, of housing. Uh, if that was more of a speculative thing, we then looked at uh, Highline in Manhattan and specifically at how, you know, while it built, it was built for public money, uh, costed $187 million. It brought $3.5 billion of property value uplift. So you can see that kind of bell curve and the closer properties um, to this, this beautiful park are the more kind of they went up in price. And we were trying to make this argument that some of that value uplift, which is caused by public investment, could have been also somehow um, being brought back to, to the public. Uh, in 2019, we got this beautiful apartment uh, in Kiev uh, to set up our office here. We kind of started renovating it, uh, completely destroying a bunch of stuff. Um, and, and you know, like as we were doing that, uh, we were talking to our colleagues at Climate Kick about the, the damage that you know, like average construction projects have to environment. We we know that um, construction industry is responsible for a big chunk of CO2 emissions. And what we did was we made these builders basically like document everything they bring into this modest little apartment. And it still created the data set that is massive, as you can imagine, involving a lot of these things. This was later part of the exhibitions. But the, the simple thing we did was we tried to measure how much things costed for our own sake, what is the expected life expectancy of those elements, but also what is the embodied um, CO2 that those construction elements have. Which, as again, you know, any brick in order to burn it, certain type of energy is used, and therefore it's kind of built into these elements. So we built this tool in order for people to be able to track these things. And um, 
I wanted to point out this thing, which is, you know, in, in most of the work that we do, you will see this later when I show you investigative work, we have this 3D model that basically works for us as a spatial archive. It's something that is operative and something that kind of contains a lot of data that can help us understand certain more complex issues. So in this case, for instance, we, we then stuffed this apartment with a bunch of sensors to understand the kind of how temperature fluctuates in the place or how kind of lighting works and stuff like that. This is my desk in the flat. Unfortunately, I haven't kind of sat on this desk since um, late February. And, and this is the view that you see from, from the window of the office. And obviously, as uh, silk is spoiled, my, my punch lines will, will come back to these uh, these things. Uh, so, so this is where our office is and this is where the TV tower is. But um, the last thing I will show you before we go to investigative stuff is the only projects that we did, which was to do with history and with looking back, and in fact, uh, with looking with quite tragic history, um, you just witnessed the changing of the landscape of uh, so-called Babanyar, which is the well-known uh, Holocaust site. Um, 33 um, southern Jews were killed here in the course of two days on September 29th and 30th, 1941. And as you could see in that uh, animation, um, that place changed quite radically. Uh, here you can see it comparing to contemporary landscape. This place is so unrecognizable today that basically people's relationship to it is fairly abstract. Uh, and this was the problem that we were hired to help address. Uh, the first thing we did was we built a 3D model of this terrain, which is a historic terrain of Babanyar. These are ravines, which are geological formations that are basically formed as a result of water going through, through the terrain. And here you can see how this place got flattened. So um, this flattening is, is intentional, and I'll talk a bit about it. But going back to a relationship to these sites being a bit abstract, these photographs are iconic. Uh, everyone who studies Holocaust knows these photographs. They represent Bob and Yar. The shocking thing is that people didn't know where they were taken precisely because this place has been changed so much. Um, so what we had to do was basically stare at them for a couple of weeks, look at bushes and you know hills and stuff like that. And then we built this 3D model based on the, the model that I showed you overlaid with aerial images. And what that gave us a chance to do was identifying the exact spot from which these photographs were taken. These are all kinds of photographs that were taken around Bob and Yar, but with with this hill spinning and these markers kind of being positioned in a certain way, we were, we were able to identify the angle from which the photograph was taken. And later, my colleague um, Kolya called, uh, wrote this script, which precisely positions a camera in the 3D space that corresponds to the place where the photographer stood once they took this picture. So um, this was solved in this way, and we were able to actually pinpoint the exact locations of where these photographs were taken. If you, if you look at it, uh, it turns out you know some of them are on the road, and it, which is not surprising that, that people have a weird way of kind of not being able to tell what this place is today. Um, we worked further on this um, topic up until the invasion, and what we were building is a much more complex spatial archive, which which involved, for instance, work with witness testimonies. There's a bunch of them recorded. And here you can see that we analyzed these texts. We selected certain topographic um, identificators that were able with, with the help of which we were able to say, select the name of the street and see all the witness testimonies that uh, kind of mentioned that street. So this type of work we continue to do now, and you, you will see that in the investigative work that I'll show you a bit later. But again, this, this model works for us as a, as a kind of a device to which we can add certain layers that can help us understand things. So it works both uh, as an archive and as an operative tool for us to, to better understand things. A very quick. Uh, 
kind of like um, run through the fate of this place further. Um, I mentioned that over 33,000 Jews were killed there over the course of two days, but if you ca calculate um, the victims of Babinyar over the course of German occupation, it's up until 100,000. And um, before leaving Kiev, uh, they set up these concentration camps uh, right next to Babinyar, uh, where people who, who lived there were actually tasked to go to these ravines and dig out um, the remains of the people and burn them. So this was the first kind of attempt to conceal the, the war crimes. Uh, surprisingly, what the Soviets did was kind of similar, they, as in, in the first place, they had this architecture competition to commemorate the victims of Babinyar, but then they decided that this topic is kind of um, inconvenient, and they started to develop this region. It was filled with liquid mud from the nearby um, brick factory. So you can see here, this is the period from 1943 to, to 1960s where you can no longer see this, this terrain. And even after that, people were still coming here. People were still kind of trying to commemorate this place, but they were persecuted. And um, th there are a lot of records in KGB archives on the people you see in this photograph. Um, in early 70s, um, this TV tower was constructed. Uh, basically on this flattened landscape, uh, quite quite close to it. Um, what, what is interesting about it is it was first designed for Moscow, uh, and then they kind of didn't like the design, so they they picked another design, but they decided to implement it in Kiev. Uh, the only issue is Kiev had to wait before the Moscow finish it, uh, finishes its own TV tower, and this TV tower was designed to be a bit taller than the Moscow one, so it also had to be downscaled to kind of, you know, not uh, kind of, the, the size fight is something uh, that the empires like, care about. Um, <laughs> So as you see this beautiful TV tower, I can see it from my window. Uh, and then this is the, the first actually incident that we started to investigate as soon as the, the full-scale invasion happened. Um, I have to say that we started to look at the cases uh, on the night of 24th of February. We couldn't sleep. We were up pretty late that night, and we were already mapping, trying to understand things. But when the missiles hit Babinyar, we could not kind of not take it as a first case. Even President Zelensky tweeted about it. And we wanted to actually like understand how close to Babinyar these missiles uh, fell, and actually, in the first place, what actually happened. Because as it turned out, there were two missiles. The first one hit the TV tower, and the second one seemingly targeted the TV tower, but missed it, and hit 200 meters away across the road, killing five civilians. And that photograph I saw once on the move in Carpathian Mountains, and th what do you see here blurred? I, I saw that without blur, and it was very shocking because my colleague sent it to me saying, look, these are, these are corpses next to Bob and Yar again. So again, we wanted to be very precise and very clear about how close this is to Bob and Yar. We looked at our previous uh, maps and basically pinpointed the exact locations where these missiles hit. Uh, what is also kind of uh, iconic is that the building that was exploded as a result of this, which is here, was planned to be the museum, which, you know, all of us, the, the commission that we did all of this Bob and Yark um, work was commissioned by, um, run by an organization, Bob and Yark Holocaust Memorial Center. Uh, and of course, it is iconic that uh, denazifier, denazifiers, as they call themselves, they, they hit uh, one of the most important Holocaust sites in Ukraine. Uh, but there, there are other echoes that, and other kind of meanings in this attack that are important for us. One of them is this kind of fight for an ability to tell your story. You can see, if you look at uh, the site, the history of Eurasia, you can see how evidence was destroyed, and you can see how that place was kind of um, obliterated in a way that, you know, people even who, who know the city well don't understand what happened there. Um, this is a big problem, and especially in, in, in situation when, let's say, Mariupol is being destroyed, 
it's so important to be able to transmit your news. Uh, so, of course, it is symbolic as an attack because it hit Babinyar. It is also symbolic because it hit still the tallest tower um, structure in Ukraine. But it's also important that it's, it's an attempt to silence, an attempt to not let us tell the stories of what is going on. So these are all the cities where TV towers were targeted or taken by military force. Uh, Kyiv was first of them, but uh, only if you calculate the, the places that were hit during the war. On the east, right at the border with um, Donetsk area, there is this town of Komishevaha, which was targeted on the 21st of November 2021, so before the war. Um, so this type of work that we do goes to um, legal procedures. We try to supplement uh, people who already file um, cases for the courts with information, as it was in case of Mykolaiv government building. It's another attempt to strike at Ukrainian, in this case, literally Ukrainian government. Uh, the only video that captured this strike is here. And what you see on this video is a missile that flies past a beautiful landscape of Mykolaiv and hits the, the building. And you know, we spotted exactly where this camera is located uh, through a friend's truth hounds with whom we collaborated on this case. And that gave us a chance to exactly locate the, uh, the, the 3D landscape of Mykolaiv against the exact photograph, right? So you can see that these are quite similar. And if you look technically what the video is, is, is of course a, a set of frames. So what we were able to retrieve from this video is 17 pictures of the of this rocket. And since we understand exactly where this camera stands in 3D space, we can also measure its length and its speed. So because of that work, we were able to determine that um, the missile is sea launched and our colleagues from Truthhounds um, managed to identify within the range of this missile the only ship that was there, which then they all, even in their report, mentioned their captains and the crew who basically committed this war crime. Uh, the reason it is a war crime, of course, is because it's a purely civilian target. If you think about this attack, uh, it happened at the moment after Mykolaiv was encircled. I'll show you in a bit. This is a, this is a video which shows where the missile uh, targeted exactly, because this is also something you can do if you have a 3D model, right? Once you exactly model the trajectory, you can turn and see uh, where the missile hits, and that can be proven by a 3D scan, which we then conducted on site with, again, our, the help of our colleagues of Truth Hounds, uh, where also you can see structural damage of the building and determine where the epicenter of the explosion was. So this is the story that I was telling, that when Mykolaiv was encircled in early uh, March, uh, Russian, Russians had to retreat uh, after, and the, the, the strike happens after they understand they're unable to take it over, which again, it, it does um, sound like an attempt to weaken, right? There's no uh, military reason for this strike. The whole area was... Um, attacked by, by Russian forces, which means Mykolaiv region had issues with water and electricity, and people who worked in this building were trying to fix those issues. Of course, buildings like this are equipped with all the communication, infrastructure, computers, and stuff like that. That is all destroyed. What we did after was a very quick look at history of this site, and you know what happens if you look at it is you learned there's a building which was built here before this building where there was this massive aquarium. A lot of rich people decided to build it in order to create this unique for Europe 3,000 letters aquarium. And then there was a church that was exploded by dynamite in 1937. And by the way, the guy who ran this aquarium was persecuted twice and was imprisoned in 1937 for the second time and died in prison. And then the other person who was against the explosion of the church found this amazing archeological site, which basically is called Kimeropolis. It's one of the cities that Greek, Greece, Greek cities um, traded wheat with. 
and of course for this he was also um, repressed and he also was um, in jail in 1937. So uh, if you look at the history of one little site where the bomb falls and you just try to go into Wikipedia and understand what's happened around it, you will see these waves of destruction and erasure, which is good for us to see in a way that it helps to understand the repetitive nature of, of the struggle that we face now, and it helps to understand that the war started maybe not even on the 24th of February, not maybe even on the, in 2014, but maybe sometime earlier. Um, I will finish with saying that um, you know, it's quite strange to be in a theater space with you. Um, this is a Renaissance polymath um, theater of memory. Uh, it was meant as a design um, kind of exercise to design a space where all human knowledge could have been all fit together. And it, it's part of the larger history of Method of Loki, which starts from the poet Seminides, who came to perform a poem at a rich man's house. And as he was taking a break outside, the building where this dinner was happening collapsed and all the people died. So he had to go through their remains, he had to, from his memory, reconstruct where people sat, and he had to basically, to tiniest detail, uh, reconstruct in his memory what, what happened here. This is where in the rhetorical tradition method of Loki is originating. And this is something very literally uh, of what we do now with uh, theater in Mariupol. So uh, very early after this attack happened, we were able to find drawings of the building. We managed to reconstruct the building in a lot of detail. We also have a lot of scans of this building. And as you can see here, this is a scan of the building before the explosion where you can see the exterior of a building. And once you match them, you can go through these spaces and we work with witnesses to, to understand what happened, um, what happened in this building. So not only we are interested to exactly reconstruct the explosion and how it happened, where the people who survived war and what kind of uh, impact it caused on them, it's also fascinating to try to understand how they lived in this building. Uh, at the peak of its population, the theater uh, had one and, a one and a half thousand people who lived in this theater. Um, if it was a cultural institution and a place of cultural production during uh, the time before the war, it definitely remained so even after the invasion, even after people were ripping the seats apart from the auditorium to make little beds for them, because they were all collaborating with each other, helping each other, aiding each other, and as they referred to this um, societal formation that they had, they call it a commune, they had a lot of roles, someone cooked, someone took care of babies, and this is also a story that we really want to record and to, to reconstruct. So if um, theater of memory is this mnemonic device where you have a building that helps to store public knowledge, here it's also a bit of something that we do, but we really hope that by doing this, we will be able to find new facts about this attack. We'll be able to preserve the memory of everything that happened here and maybe um, find responsible ones. So um, with that, I'll say that if you want to follow what we do, you can find us at Investigation Support, which is the website where we publish these investigations. And we are on social media at spatialtech.info. Thank you. Thank you very much for sharing. Um, when we
started talking and I honestly can't remember when that was the case. I know who got us in touch, which is a common contact, Anna Schröter, who's a human rights lawyer based in Berlin. She actually introduced me to you. Um, we started talking and initially you pointed out that you're working on this investigation of the theater, on the deadly attack of the, to the theater in Mariupol in the aftermath, but you were not sure whether to include it today or not. I'm, I'm glad that you decided to talk about it today. Um, and that brings me to the very first question. We have seen a lot of data work that you presented, photos, videos that you brought together, tested and verified the geolocations, the meter data, the EXIF data, but you also said that you talked to people and that you look for witnesses. How does that work? Could you give us insights on that part of the job that you're doing too? Yes, uh, I also, as you mentioned, uh, Anne, I wanted to mention that we are now working in Berlin, um, hosted by Forensic Architecture, which is a practice that we quite admired and we always kind of followed their work. Um, and at some point during the Babinyar work, we kind of spotted their um, yeah, we, we managed to get in touch with them and ask them for, for feedback. And from then we kind of were in touch with, uh, with them and they host us. Uh, but in this collaboration, we learn a lot from them. But one thing, of course, that we're able to contribute is that we are a Ukrainian organization and it was quite easy to uh, find a lot of witnesses. So even ourselves, without massive media support, we managed to find around 35 people who were in the theater, which is quite a lot. Um, 13 of them agreed to talk to us. And you know, we already could figure out a lot of things from talking to them. And the way we talk to them is we first ask them very generic questions. So tell us how the war started for you, why did you come to the theater and stuff like that. But we end by showing the, them our drawings and our models and asking them where exactly they slept, what kind of role they played within this um, assemblage of the theater. And when you show them space, of course, they recall a lot of stuff and a lot of very interesting stuff for us, specifically around the explosion where the people were who died, maybe, and stuff like that. So um, these sessions with, with these people, we kind of take also as a collaboration because you can see from how they talk to us that they're actually willing to also kind of make sure that people know what happened there. Um, they're very open, some of them, you know, we have repeated contacts with, um, like one of the people who started this shelter are actors of the theater. Mm -hmm. And we have very active correspondence to them when we send them drawings and they demarcate like the function of the room before the war or you know how many people lived here during the war, which is super helpful for us because with the um, forensic architecture techniques, we can understand where exactly the epicenter of the explosion is and what are the rooms that got damaged the most. But then, yeah, you can... Before we continue, I think we need to quickly take that detour and explain a bit more about forensic architecture because I'm not quite sure whether that is an organization that is quite well known. Could you fill us in? Yes. So if you saw our kind of like media savvy experiments that I showed in the beginning, um, one of the leaders in this area of kind of using architectural tools and applying them to different topics are forensic architecture. Their London-based practice that is directed by A.L. Weizmann and um, they basically pioneered using um, architectural models in order to try to solve war crimes and people like human rights violations. Uh, and we we always always knew of their work and learned a lot from their work, but again, we never thought we'll be kind of doing a s similar work to them. Um, yeah, at the same time when this whole thing happened, it was an obvious collaboration for us. Mm -hmm. And again, the the method that you mentioned as the forensic architecture method is 
very similar to what we have seen. But on top of that, coming back to interviews that you conduct with people on the ground, how do you get in touch? How did you find those 35 out of 13 then eventually talk to you? How did you find them? How do you keep in touch? Yeah, so originally we found those people, as I said, ourselves, just trying to see if they already gave interviews, or we also have a lot of friends who are from Mariupol, and through them we found maybe five people. It's always like this, someone knows someone. Um, last week we made this Instagram post which went viral, and we managed to find approximately as many people through that as we did before, and people write wrote to us themselves basically asking like can we help um, I was there or I saw the rocket and stuff like that which is super super useful for us you cannot meet those people in person I suppose how do you communicate um, originally we conduct these interviews online showing them our screen asking them the questions but in fact we want to bring them all in the same space it's quite challenging, but I'm pretty sure we will do that with people who will agree to this. Because as I said about the fact that the space kind of evokes memories, it is so, but it's even stronger when you're in the same spot and you can kind of look at these things together. What we want to try to understand is where exactly those people were at the moment of explosion and with their help basically reconstruct the explosion from the X amount of at the points that we'll be able to get in as high detail as we can. Uh, so basically, like, even someone's body records a lot of stuff that happened in that situation when you have bruises, you have stucco in your mouth after the explosion, and details like that help us a lot to understand how a certain space of the theater was damaged. Being a reporter, having worked with traumatized people in the past, do you have a professional on your team who has practice in interviewing highly possibly tra traumatized persons? Yeah, this is this is where it, this work is super challenging because we had to learn a lot of stuff that we never thought about. And we had to go through this workshop about, you know, how to not re-traumatize these people. We also have access to, which is amazing, Forensic Architecture Network, and they've conducted interviews like this many times. So having, we basically talk to experts who did it with them almost every week, trying to share with them how we do it and make sure how, what we can and cannot do. And Anne, we mentioned her in the very beginning, she is one of those persons who has, as per her profession as a human rights lawyer, has that practice, right? Yeah. Yeah. That is a separate realm of expertise that we have no idea about and that we are very lucky to have a uh, European Center for Human Rights sitting right next to us. We also have meetings with them. But this is the thing, if, if earlier we were hacking around and playing, now we have to go through all of these boring meetings with lawyers who tell us, you cannot do this, seriously, like, don't do this. We listen to them, but we kind of still yeah. are these kind of a bit uh, disobedient kids who sometimes push them and ask, but, but why? Can you can you maybe do that because with law that is a lot more trickier than with trauma that is for sure you always say we and you started off your talk saying i represent the center for spatial technologies so who's we who yeah. forms we this we that you're talking about before the war we were 12 people in cave uh now we're down to six we had a period of almost fully dysfunctioning for two and a half months when the war started and the six people who we have are also scattered around some of them are in berlin some of them are still in ukraine uh, but the work that we do is highly collaborative as much as it is inside the team it is also collaborative because we work with ukrainian ngos with forensic architecture with uh, media partners who help us get the, out there and get more witnesses um, so i would say 
this undisciplined kind of nature that I mentioned in the beginning is in this context still quite helpful because we, we want to learn from all these people. You also mentioned two and a half months of being sort of paralyzed, turmoil. How did you manage to overcome that state? I don't know if we've overcome that state. Uh, I mean, we were still also functional in some way. Um, personally, for me, this work is a way of coping, actually, because you know you. And this is what we were doing for those two and a half months. We were also s sitting in the mountains and still collecting data about the strikes and stuff like that and looking at them in a lot of detail. What I showed you, of course, is, is kind of a tip of an iceberg. We monitor a lot more cases that we managed to then deal with. And there are a lot of also, and not a lot of, but there are like three, four topics that we are working on that we are not sharing yet. Um, so yes, that's, it's, it's a way of coping it through work, basically. You mentioned the collaboration with the press. Uh, I mentioned two pieces, the one you got interviewed for, another one that you collaborated on with the New York Times. How important are those collaborations with traditional media houses, big brands in, in international media for you and your work? I mean, for sure it's important for credibility, even if, you know, we want to partner with certain experts. For instance, now we are tr trying to search for explosion experts, who are people who can tell us exactly how the building was exploded through the structural model that we are building. And of course it helps to show them in New York Times piece. For us, uh, it was a lot more functional to work with Ukrainian media because they're also kind of are always at the edge of investigative journalism. Sometimes they have these contacts that we don't have. And you know, it's very easy to form associations with them where we can, mm -hmm. can also transmit data internally with these organizations. Uh, but of course it's uh, publications like New York Times were, were massive for us because also, you know, that helps us to get out there and share our work much more broadly. Is it also a source of financing the CST? No. How do you finance the CST? Um, well, so before the war we were a for-profit company trying to get commissions and we did all of these experimental stuff, especially that has to do with sustainability being funded through, you know, European Union initiatives for um, climate, against climate change and stuff like that. So that is the area which is fairly well funded. And now we work on a completely different topic that we know quite little about, but there is a lot of, there are a lot of people who just wanted to support what we do. Um, yeah, we basically didn't even have to ask for money. So you managed to continue the work, obviously having shifted without financial pressure. Is that, did I get that correctly from you? And no, I mean, so this is also where being next to big established organization helps a lot. So media attention is great, but I can't say how important for us the collaboration with the face. Um, I mean, they are just a perfect organization to facilitate the work that we do now. And they also have contacts with all of these funders who look for funding the work that, you know, that they do. And of course, when the war started, a lot of these funders asked them if they could do something on Ukraine and if they, you know, if they're already investigating cases. And as soon as we started talking and we did also the New York Times piece together, they were basically redirecting those people to us, which was great for us. I mean, we are still looking for a way to grow. Like now we're down to six people and it's, everything we do is very kind of like diligent and takes a lot of time. I, to be honest, I don't know how much we can scale that uh, just because of uh, amount of effort and attention that it goes towards one case. Uh, but the hope is that we could do more cases in the future and, you know, for, for that. But, but again, for now we are relying on bigger institutions that are helping us to do the work. And what, what we have to do is to propose topics that we want to investigate and how much time and money we need for that. Mm. You mentioned several projects that you are working on, other investigations. Can you share 
a glimpse of what you're working on and what we can expect from you in the near um, future? Yeah, so w one important thing is I probably managed to convey this idea that what we basically do always is build a 3D model and we use it as an archive to add a lot of stuff around it in order to then understand something. So in that way, the model works both as, a, as an archive and as a research tool. But what we are also exploring now is how that can be a storytelling device. So if you go to investigation support, you will already see some examples of that. But with the theater, we are hoping to push that much, much, much more forward, where you can really learn about the story of the theater through the space. Uh, we have one big project that is really exciting, and it has to do with Ukrainian wheat. The topic of wheat is, is very important for Ukraine. It stands for the yellow and the flag. And you know, it's, Ukraine is one of the big producers of, of wheat. It's always been perceived by colonial powers as a breadbasket of whatever they, they're trying to colonize. Um, of course, it was a massive thing when you know uh, the Black Sea got uh, blockaded by Russian navy. The trains cannot go to the west as fast as they could because the rail width is different and that is because of the history of the war. Uh, so we're trying to investigate basically how much uh, damage that caused and also of course there are intentional Russian strikes on that in infrastructure uh, starting from bridges and tunnels and, and roads ending with um, wheat silos and grain terminals and you know like ports so we're trying to map that uh, strategically in, on an infrastructural level to help understand to which extent this um, kind of grain producing uh, industries is damaged. Thank you for sharing that, that glimpse, uh, for pushing aside the, the curtain a bit. Uh, thank you very much again for being here. We would like to open up um, to the audience um, your questions. You're very much welcome to pose questions, either in English or German, um, however you feel more comfortable with. Yeah, I, I guess we need a bit, a bit of light, a different light, if that's possible. And please, yeah, go ahead. What would you like to know? Uh, so this is probably a, con a question you've gotten plenty of times before, but uh, how did you get started in working in 3D modeling? And where did you get started with the idea of using it to recreate history? Wow. No, it's not, it's not the question that I get often. Uh, I mean, I was, basically I grew up playing computer games and then I got into 3D modeling. Uh, <laughs> That's a very short version. <laughs> Could you elaborate a bit? Um, Okay, I am trained as an architect, that also helped. Uh, well, if I'm being serious, on the one hand, these tools are really important and playing with tools is something that is in our DNA. So it's super important for us to, you know, be updated on what kinds of tools are available. For instance, the, when I showed aerial photographs matching on Bab and Yar, my colleague Kola developed this method of using photogrammetry to match aerial photographs from 1943, so that basically the plane that took the photographs for reconnaissance purposes produced a 3D model uh, like in an automated way of the terrain. Uh, and experiments like this are, are, are really important for us. But I also do think that this is something that we are trying to develop into a more kind of like available to anyone method where, where the space is being used as a kind of a vehicle for researching things, be that a flat that has a embodied carbon in it or a city which has an uneven distribution of money through real estate or, or war crime. Hi. 
Um, I'm really curious about the relationship to the Ukrainian state that your organization has, because as far as I understand, for example, forensic architecture has a quite a strong ethics about state, the state, and, and collaborating or not collaborating with state entities. Yeah. So I'm very curious about how to navigate that in the current situation. This was one of the things that silly kids didn't know about. And, you know, on one of these first meetings, I was like, oh, why don't we ask the police? Maybe they have that. And they were just like, come on, like, you don't do this. Uh, we, we, we don't know this game, uh, but we have a lot of colleagues who help us. And in, indeed, if you work with, let's say, local prosecutors, the case will not be possible to submit to um, like international courts because, of course, you have a bias. Um, this is the funniest story around these lines was we were looking for explosion experts, as I said, and forensic architecture suggested we probably look for someone who's in Ukraine. Uh, and we know this guy who's an amazing uh, steel engineer. And we thought maybe he could help us and we reached, reached out and he indeed knows a lot about stuff like that. Very strong pressure, explosion. He was able to tell us so much. We learned a bit from it. And then we asked him, how are you doing right now? And he told us, I'm in Azov Regiment, <laughs> which is the kind of like a force that Russia accuses for, for exploding theater, which is of course extreme nonsense. But of course we cannot use his expertise now because <laughs> he, yeah, so we are learning these things things uh, along the road and uh, yeah we cannot get any of those materials from persecutors even if they have them um, how much does it help um, the, the geographic data infrastructure that was beforehand available that now has mainly changed how much can you fall back on the data or um, also the photogrammatic models that you're using, or the very well-built city models. How much do you have to remodel yourself, and how much was it already available? For the major cities, I assume yes, but if you want to scale up to the whole country, what would your way be to go about that? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I mean, again, we have people in our team who are extremely good at stuff like this and sometimes we can get a model of a city for instance like Mekolaev from open sources. The, model, the models that we get from open sources sometimes are not precise enough for our purposes and then we either need to hack around to find a way to make them more precise and this is something that we are currently doing in Mariupol. Uh, Kola just messaged me yesterday that he got a, an exact position of Maxar satellite, which took one of the photographs. Uh, okay, so Maxar, another organization, I think we should quickly describe what they do. Oh, Maxar is the uh, is a reseller of uh, satellite images. So basically, like he's managed to spot where exactly that satellite is uh, uh, over the planet because it took one of the important photographs of Mariupol Theater, and you know there is a way to to do that. In any case, this is just an example of okay. Once we have the raw model, we can make it much more precise, and then you, you, sometimes you need to handcraft and and make some things more detailed. And for instance, around the theater, we have a colleague who has been building uh, 3D models of trees to be exactly the trees that were there and have exact branches the way they had there because also after the explosion certain trees got fallen certain trees got kind of some of the branches uh, kind of destroyed and through that that is also a form of evidence that we can use to to understand the explosion more questions what would you like to know the presentation. Uh, I would like to ask how you're thinking to rebuild Ukraine after the invasion and how it's going to be support this forensic architecture data after uh, trying to rebuild again. 
because I think it's really important to use it uh, as a structure, as a thing. Sure. No, that's a great question. I, I was in this Reconstruction Ukraine conference just a couple of weeks ago. Mm, I have to admit I'm quite paralyzed to think about that. Um, in a way that it's quite hard to think about reconstruction when there is still war and it's unclear when it's gonna finish. Um, the gaze that we have now is directed towards history somehow and that seems very relevant for reconstructing Ukraine in the future. So maybe my response to that is that it's precisely through trying to understand these key locations which are important to understand this war that we will be able to also generate intuition about how to reconstruct in the future. But we don't do anything actively now to, to pursue that. Another question. I said, if you feel more comfortable in asking in German, please feel free to do so. We're happy to translate. When we get into the aspect of the storytelling part, you were explaining lots of technical things. How, like, is it more like to explain the importance of a building, why it was chosen as a target to be stroke, or what can we expect from the storytelling project you were talking about that you would like to invest more time in? Yeah, that's a good question, thank you. Um, one thing that we realize is happening is a lot of people are learning about Ukraine, Ukrainian cities through the war. So Mariupol is a city that a lot of people didn't know about, and now in their mind it's this debris, a basically tor torn, burnt relics of, of what it was. So we kind of think that it is, it is important and crucial for us to not only investigate those war crimes, but also show how those places were before the war. And their, their beauty and their richness of history and the continuity of the struggle that is going on now. Uh, and that may be a bit boring if you start presenting that in a form of history, especially if you do it to people who have no connection to this stuff. But we find these media instruments quite good at being able to link some of these stories in a way that then is, is very, very good to digest that information and kind of understand it spatially, if that makes sense. There was a question, and question. thank you, Pia, for showing your hand. So I like a lot how you visualize the 3D space and 2D space. Um, the, the sense of, of the stories. And I'm wondering how, because you work on very different scales, one of this, the scale of when you analyze the damage is down to the detail, down to the material, you may use BIM models and stuff like that, and now you go and analyze uh, the large scale through the whole country, trying to point how um, the infrastructure in transporting weed is affected. Um, how are you planning to do the whole analysis and the archiving in the aftermath of all your work? Are you planning to link that together? So, but in the end, you end up having some infrastructure. In addition to that, not only how, in the sense of how do those investigations blend or are, can be linked to each other, but also technically. How do you store, how do you archive? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I like that question a lot because this is actually how we started. So before the TV Tower strike, uh, 
what we were building was an archive of all of the media that are shared around in telegram groups and you know all kinds of other social media just diligently collected and assigned with metadata and through that work we started to meet a lot of people who were doing similar things and that reached the moment when we realized that a lot of people are doing this and we, we just shared with them our data and, and stopped doing that. Instead we decided to focus on these more iconic cases. Uh, ones where even if it doesn't like it doesn't explain a certain period of war or a region, it's deep enough to help you understand the logics that are important to understand this war. And I think the, yeah, the, the, the methodology that we are following now has to do with focusing on these key locations as opposite to you know, like kind of like a um, huge archive, huge data set, which would also be resource uh, draining for us. Um, with wheat, it's easier because, you know, f again, we are trying to partner, as we often do, with people who already have a lot of tools to record some of that information. Uh, on the other hand, it's, it's the question of scale is uh, pre-solved for us by the our parent discipline of architecture where, you know, if you need to model the detail, you use a certain program. If you need to use a building, it's another one. And if you need to look at the scale of a country, there is a completely different type of GIS tools that you use. So jumping scales is, is not uh, problematic for us. It's more that we are trying to pick the cases in a way that they help to understand this whole thing as much as, as possible. Please raise your hand if you have a question. Um, one, two. Thank you. Hi, okay, so the question is, I'm not sure if I'm supposed to ask you about this question, by, but my question is about the renovation process when the war is finished. So, you know, about this conflict, about the building's appearance, so, um, like, inner and outer appearance. So when the war is over and we need to rebuild all the buildings, how will they look like? So should we rebuild them as, um, as they were before, in a classic way, like, you know, the classical appearance, or should we renovate them in a completely new way, like with a completely modern appearance, or like, I suppose you got it. Thank you. I don't know. No, it's a complicated question, but I really think we should win the war first. That's like, it's very hard to talk about renovation. I, I, with renovation, I think it depends on each case, it, depending on the building, depending on its symbolic meaning, depending on you know environmental impact that it has. It can be solved, but and it's quite much easier to solve yeah, than. Like a theater, you know, yeah. it's a classic horse, so which opinion do you prefer yourself? Should we feel it conservative in this way, or should we be more modern and relate it in a modern way? Modern. Thank you. There was a lady in the... I think yeah, there you go. Hi, thank you for your presentation and being open for the questions. You said before that obviously you had to relocate and the work with witnesses changed in the sense that you would like to get them to Berlin because getting in a conversation really helps facilitate the process of them sharing their stories. So now I was wondering how did your day-to-day -day work change? Did you do a lot of field studies before with the work that you did with the Ukraine? Um, or is it fairly similar that you could go about doing the work obviously next to all the stuff that is happening? 
I think we would we would greatly benefit from having access to the sites that we study, as it always happens. We try to do that as much as we can through our collaborators and part of the team that is in Ukraine. Uh, for instance, the, my colleague Darina managed to, to find the drawings of the theater very quickly, being being there, going to the right library, and, and you know, those those that was quite important for us. Um, the witnesses are scattered around uh, both Ukraine and Europe, so in that way, these sessions that we are planning to do, it's it's good that part of our team is is in Ukraine, part of our team is here. So in that way, it's we can access both parts of the witness pool that we are working with. Um, yeah, but of course, it's it's always good to be close to the subject that you're studying. Shall we take one last question? Last question for tonight before we wrap up. Hey, then I would say we close, fade out. Thank you very much, Maxime, for sharing insights, um, letting us look into your way of working, yours and your team. And thank you very much, especially for being here. Thanks thank for you. having me.